Good morning. morning. Welcome, people of St. Paul's. I am uh, Pastor Russ Sorensen, and it's good to be back to be with you and uh, share worship with you today. And uh, the pressure is off of me because Bob Matthews is going to preach today. (laughs) We're looking looking forward to that, Bob, as well. But I'm really happy to be back with you. You guys are going to have a pretty busy week, it looks like. Uh, I'll be back uh, through this week. The theological conference will be held here at St. Paul Lutheran. We'll keep uh, uh, each other in prayer as we, as we uh, share this time together. I'll be back all through the, through the week as well. Thank you for your gracious hospitality, for that gift of welcome uh, to come together as a people of God in, in our conference, especially, but also a part of the synod making this whole connection throughout all of our wide geographic synod through, as many of you I think know, through Wyoming and Colorado and Utah and New Mexico and El Paso, Texas. That's a large area. It's actually the largest geographic synod in the ELCA, if I'm correct. (laughs) But it it is a wonderful space and wonderful, gracious people. Uh, It is uh, also uh, preparation time for the election of a new bishop this next year. So it's a really, really important time to come together as a people and to make preparation for asking for God's spirit to be a part of our process and to be center in our life together. So please, please, please pray for the Rocky Mountain Synod and for our common ministry together. Thank you for being here. I know you could do a lot of things in the morning. You could probably sleep in, but you're here. And that's great. You're part of our worshiping together. God is present. God is great. And thank you for being a part of this worshiping community this day. I won't, of course, highlight all your announcements. They're listed well there uh, in the bulletin materials. But I'm glad to see that you're connected and a part of ministry here together in the Albuquerque area, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks for being with us. Let's stand for our, uh, our gathering hymn, When We Are Living. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. 
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, we confess that we have captive sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inex inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
The first reading is from Genesis. Realizing that, the father, that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers say, what, is Joseph, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approach Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept. They fell down before him and say, we are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a, nu a numerous people, as God is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, Joseph reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Word of God, word of life. Um, we will speak psalm responsibly. Lord, you are full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and uh, abounding in steadfast love. You have not dealt with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. The second reading is from Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one, one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds those who observe the day observe in the honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While well, those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lives again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, say the Lord, every knee shall bow down to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Word of God, word of life.
The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the dominion of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. And his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. I don't get to speak to an outfit like this very often, but when I do, it seems as I look back on it, every, every time I do, I'm talking about the kingdom of God. Today is no exception, since the gospel comes from a long stretch of God, Matthew's gospel where Jesus talks about the kingdom. He's got parables that describe the kingdom in many ways, but today's gospel is somewhat singular because it talks about how we live in the kingdom. We'll get that in, the, in a bit. Uh, I just have to say today, the kingdom of God also seems to be a topic of a lot of conversation in politics and society. If you listen between the lines, so to speak, and we'll get to that. But first I want to tell a story just for fun. For several years, Nancy and I have traveled to and around the United Kingdom. It's not exactly unrelated to what we're talking. There we have learned quite a bit that you don't read about in the guidebooks or see on uh, Masterpiece Theater. One of the more interesting bits we learned is the so-called Glastonbury legend. This legend uh, originated in southwest England around the village of Glastonbury. The story is that back in the day when trade with Roman Empire was a big thing, a certain tin merchant from Syria visited the area on a number of occasions. Tin was mined in that area of England, and this merchant came to town to buy tin and send it back to the more populated areas of the uh, Roman Empire where you can make, you know, tin makes all kinds of things. It doesn't grow so you can make containers and tableware, but you also alloy it with copper and it makes bronze, which is a tough, hard metal. It takes a good edge. You can cast it. It makes great weapons and armor. 
but also art. Well, the merchant's name was Joseph. Joseph of Arimathea. Yes, the very man who took Jesus' body off the cross and prepared him for burial. It was him. But wait, there's more. Joseph, it turns out, was Jesus' uncle. According to the legend. And on one or more occasions, this nephew accompanied him to Britain. Now, there's no historical or biblical evidence of any of this, but the people in Glastonbury still swear it's true. This story would be a, a, just another quaint, quirky story among the many in England, but for the great eccentric poet William Blake. In one of his poems, written at about the turn of the 19th century, he rehearses the Glastonbury legend in verse. And did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth on our cloudy hills? What a beautiful vision. I particularly like the image of the Lamb of God skipping about on the pastor. But the tone changes abruptly in the next line. He says, and was Jerusalem builded there among those dark satanic mills? What's that all about? Well, Jerusalem is Blake's term for the world as God created it to be. In Jerusalem, all the people live together in harmony because everyone is treated with respect and love that they were created to share. And why wouldn't we expect Jerusalem to be builded, that's Blake's poetic term, not mine, to be builded there where Jesus himself walked, spreading his blessing? Why indeed? But instead of Jerusalem, we got the dark satanic mills, the body-breaking, soul-killing, environment-destroying factories of the Industrial Revolution. Those mills where hundreds of thousands of workers cleared from their agricultural lands and livelihood in rural Scotland, Wales, and England toiled in what we would consider appalling conditions for starvation wages, while the factory owners became unfathomably rich. The government also became rich and used its cut of the take to expand its worldwide empire to rival Rome itself. But that's another story. Even worse, the dark satanic mills stoked the machinery of slavery Remember where the raw materials come from? Sugar from the Caribbean, cotton from America. And who would have produced them? It was as if the industrialists decided that we can't waste our time on Jerusalem until we've made a ton of money and built an empire so we can make rules and force everyone to obey them. Then we can talk about stuff like justice and equality, respect and love. Well, in today's gospel, Peter makes an odd approach to Jesus. How many times must I forgive? As many as seven times? To me, this sounds like Peter is trying to figure out the rules. Maybe he's considering writing up a manual with all of the rules to be followed in the kingdom of God. I mean, every kingdom has rules, right? So it would be nice to have them all in one place. Maybe that's just the old tech writer in me talking. But Jesus says, this is the wrong question. There are no rules. Just be forgiving. 
Jesus goes on. I'm paraphrasing here. God has given you all you have and all you are and expects exactly nothing from you except to be a human being. Now you want to beat up your neighbor because he owes you a couple hundred bucks. Can we get real here? The language in this exchange is monetary, and here's a fun fact. The servant owes his master 10,000 talents. So how big is a talent? There are differing, differing opinions, of course, but the one I, estimate I found says that a talent weighs 75 pounds. In money, that would be 75 pounds of silver. 10,000 talents would be 375 tons of silver. And on Friday's spot price for silver, that would come to $310 million. He is never going to pay that back. But the question of forgiveness goes way beyond monetary debt. Forgiveness is the only way that we can be liberated from past injuries, traumas, and slights at the hands of others. It's like there's something in our wiring that requires forgiveness in or before we can make any progress. If we don't forgive those who have hurt us, our thinking and feelings will be tied to the past forever. But let's, let's not forget that we have to forgive ourselves for past failings and disappointments as well. Now in the second reading today, Paul expands this argument beyond the question of debt. He knows Christians disagree about what you have to do to be a disciple of Jesus. Some believe in eating anything, and while the weak only eat vegetables. Some judge one day to be better than another, others judge all days to be alike. Now wait just a second. I and a lot of other Christians like to observe Lent, even with fasting, and I love to stand in vigil for the coming of the day of Easter. And who among us can live without Advent? I really wish Paul had not characterized the difference in opinions as between the strong in faith and the weak. But Paul is right to emphasize that we're justified not by how we perform our religion in public, but by the grace of God which is effective in us through faith, whether it's strong or weak or anything else. The point is, there are no rules we must obey to be children of God. God has taken care of that. There's no room for Christians to treat other Christians as less than siblings, children of the same father. We must not judge each other or anyone else. We cannot impose rules on anyone. We are no closer to God than anyone else. And we cannot dream of telling others how to live. There seems to be a feeling among Christians, of some Christians that we should establish an empire that imposes our values on everyone else. I think this is completely unacceptable. And let me tell you why. Jesus was constantly being pestered to explain the rules and structures of the kingdom. Of, and in every instance, he refused to do it. He would reply with riddles, with parables, or questions of his own. And when he came close to giving an explanation, the questioners couldn't understand him. For example, he tells Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that in order to enter the kingdom, you have to be born again from above. And poor old Nicodemus says, how can these things be? Finally, in John 18, Jesus comes close to spilling the beans to, of all people, Pontius Pilate. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. 
If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Among other things, Christians cannot, cl cannot claim special sanction to rule civil society. Christians must take part in making our society and government fair, just, and compassionate, but we cannot claim primacy over our fellow creatures and have no license to impose our preference over them in the name of the kingdom of God. It is the kingdom of God for crying out loud. There is absolutely no room for us to nurse grudges against each other in the kingdom of God. And if you think that the kingdom is off somewhere and won't be here in a while, think again. In Matthew 4, Jesus says, repent. The kingdom of heaven has come near. So, where does this leave us? Where did we find the kingdom of God? If we're looking for the kingdom, we should look at Jesus. What did he do and how did he do it? Well, one thing he did was eat. Everywhere he went, Jesus invited himself over for dinner. And sometimes Jesus served the meal himself. Remember, he fed 5,000 people. It didn't matter who was there either. Sinners, tax collectors, the whole lot. Jesus was with them and having a good time. Another thing Jesus did was heal. People came to him with all kinds of maladies and he healed them all. And Jesus prayed a lot. He would go off by himself and spend time with God. Maybe we could do something similar. We can eat together. We can welcome each other and everyone else to share food, conversation, and community with us. We can help feed the hungry in our community and everywhere else. In this regard, I'll raise a shout out to Lutheran World Relief and to ELCA Disaster Response, who are working to bring the love of God and of the, of the Lutheran community to places like Maui, Morocco, and Libya, where the need is so great. And healing. Well, my Miracle working skills are pretty rusty these days, but I can still engage in healing conversation with my neighbors, breaking down misunderstanding and offering comfort in sorrow and grief. These are evidence of the kingdom of God among us. And we too can pray for ourselves and for the world, the more the better. So, have you heard the uh, steps of those feet on our labyrinth? And has the Holy Lamb of God been seen in the gardens outside playing with the bunnies and lizards and roadrunners? Or have you noticed the countenance divine bathing our bell tower in a holy glow? No? Then come to this table. Here, Jesus Christ himself invites you to share his presence and his blessing. Here, Christ offers his body to strengthen ourselves and our community. Here, Christ's own blood offers forgiveness in overwhelming measure. Here, Christ allows us to see the reality of the kingdom of God in our own midst. It is all here for you, for us. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Rem remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. We pray for the church, bless the mission and ministries of diverse congregations that they, put, that they uplift the good news of salvation in ways that can be understood. Merciful God. We pray for creation. Send, rains to land, send rain to lands experiencing drought and healing to rivers clogged with pollution. Enrich the soil for trees and plants. Protect the crops needed to feed those who hunger. Merciful God. We pray for all who govern. Encourage those in positions of power to lead with empathy, practice forgiveness, and care for those who struggle. Merciful God. We pray for our neighbors who face illness of any kind, those who strain financially, for all living with chronic pains, mental illness, the disease of addiction, or otherwise afraid or in harm's way. Protect all who cry out for mercy. Merciful God. We pray for this, for this congregation, open our hearts to practice intentional invitation. Help us to forgive each other, practice patience, and choose wel welcome over judgment. Move us to care for those in our community seeking refuge and safety. Merciful God. We give thanks for the saints who died in faith. Show us how to live faithfully, creatively, and lovingly in your church and world. Merciful God. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these and the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you.
Let us pray. God of all creation, all of you have, all you have made is good and you love endures forever. You bring forth bread for the earth and fruit for the, from the vine. Nourish us with this gift that we might be for the world, signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. As Bob reminded us, this day we come to the presence of God, we share the gift of the meal, and we are sent forth filled with God's peace and forgiveness and grace, not because we have to, but because we get to. We get to serve, we get to be fed and to share forgiveness life with others. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. All people are called to Christ's table. Come eat what is good.
All commune together as these words are shared, the body of Christ given for you, amen. The blood of Christ shed for you, amen, as we share with our folks online as well. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you in grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.